it's something genuine and it's like it created itself. I think that one of my best feelings as well is when even at Pike Place, when people are bringing their family that are visiting in town saying, this is my, my yoga, this is where I go. There's some sort of ownership that people have once they've discovered it, you know, it's theirs. And we've created this little cult in Seattle that's been so supportive of everything we've done and it's helped us grow to where we are currently. This is Startup and Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guest is Alex Apostolopoulos, founder of the Greek yogurt company, Elenos. Elenos has gained quite the following in Seattle, drawing crowds through word of mouth advertising to their stand at the iconic Pike Place Market. But they wouldn't have even gotten to Seattle if it weren't for Yvonne Klein, a flight attendant who loved the yogurt so much that she would bring back cases of it whenever she flew to Australia. Eventually, she and her husband reached out to Alex and his father about bringing their product to the U.S. The four became business partners and set out to win consumers over one taste at a time. So listen in as we cover everything from the challenges of finding a dairy farmer in the U.S. who would work with them, if we'll see yogurt breweries pop up in the next few years, and why some of the simplest flavors are the most challenging to make. Hang on, hang on. If you're not subscribed, can you go ahead and do that right now before we get on with the video? Helps us out tremendously. That's all we ask, and we're back. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's show, we're talking to Alex, the founder of Elenos. Alex, please tell everyone a little bit about your company. Hi, uh, my name's Alex. Thanks for listening. Um, what we do is we make pretty much the best Greek yogurt you've ever tasted, or well, the best thing you've probably even tasted. It's based on my family's traditional recipe that's been handed down through generations. Yeah. That's amazing. And, uh, so, you know, it's funny. This is 10 years ago, 12 years ago. I used to be an engineer. And my last project ever, like before I went off to go to startup land, was we were doing the Chobani plant in upstate New York. Oh, yeah. And we were engineering all of it. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I got to see, so at that time, that company was like hyper growth. And I got to see how little equipment they were using and how at capacity this plant was. I mean, it was crazy. It was like, how could you guys become a household name with this type of plant? It was pretty wild. When you first got into the business, what made you, what made you want to start the company other than maybe you, you had a good product and you were like, I got to share this with the world. Like what made you want to take that leap into like doing something as crazy as starting a company with a comp highly competitive market? As you said, it is, it's pretty competitive and there's a lot of yogurt out there. I grew up in the, like, the dairy industry just because my, when my dad's family immigrated from Greece to Australia, that's what they did. They made cheese and yoga was part of it too. Okay. And I just had, I had this in my, pretty much in my blood. I remember as a young age, that smell of a dairy plant. What started Elenos was while we were doing our thing in Australia, there was a flight attendant. She was based out of Vancouver, BC. She would fly to Australia and um, not unknowing to us she was buying our family's yogurt and smuggling it back across the canadian border and then over to the states where she was living with her husband so that's bob and yvonne they're our wow. business partners so this happened for like maybe 10 years she was doing this and she was so passionate about trying to get our yogurt to the state somehow that she kind of heckled bob to try to figure out how to make it happen then what they did was they bought a produce stand at pike place market so that's the iconic market in Seattle with the idea that one day they'll bring our family's yogurt to it. So this is even before they even know who we are. And so now Bob is running a produce stand and cold calls my dad in Australia. So they just turn up at the door and say, we're from Seattle. My wife's fallen in love with your yogurt. How do we get it to the States? And at that time we were also a small company. It was like, we can't just ship it over there. We can't move over there. And we're not going to tell you how to make it. You know, it's our, that's our secret. So that kind of fizzled out. That was about 2006. Then in 2011, I had graduated. I kind of started working outside the family business for a little bit. And my dad asked me if I'd be interested in doing something with Bob and Yvonne in the States. So this is about 2011. And I thought, why not? This is something that I was passionate about. And we knew that at that stage, we... You know, Australia is still pretty, is a pretty small market and the States is always just a, it's a huge place, sure. and diverse. And we said, let's take this jump and try to make it over in uh, Seattle. So 
we moved over in 2012. And that first cup of Elanos was, so we opened up the store and Pike Place in uh, July 5th, 2013. That's incredible. That's how Ele- yeah. Yeah. That's a crazy story. I've only heard one other story like this. This is insane. So Pike Place, obviously the iconic place in Seattle where Starbucks even has, you know, grown out of really awesome destinations. So they just went at Pike's Place, just so I can get a sense of it. It was like they just had a stand, like a little area, or was it a legit storefront? It's a produce stand. So it's a okay. corner. It's pretty much the iconic spot as well. If you ever see that sign with the pike place and the clock and where the flying fish are flying underneath we're sure. we face we face that and wow. um so every day uh you, where we open up the doors it's roller doors and you push out all the produce stands come out and now now we scoop yogurt there and uh if anyone hasn't been to us we pretty much display a pretty different we our yogurt display is a lot different than any other yogurt shop you've seen it's more like a gelato stand we have a big case there it's about 30 different flavors of yogurt and then we do all the decorating and flavors at the stand there. That's using the same. That's such a crazy story. So then, okay, so as you're seeing traction, you're at Pike's Place, yeah. people are, I imagine, loving the yogurt and probably being surprised, right? I don't think anyone's ever yeah. gone to Pike Place for yogurt. And so they're tasting that, this and they're like, this is, this is good. And then at what point are you like, okay, we're really onto something. We knew we would be, but now we are. What are the next steps you start deciding to take around maybe getting into grocery stores or just building that brand? What was that like for you guys? So for the first bit, it was Pike Place was where our main, that's all the place we were selling it. We were also doing farmer's markets and wheeling out a ton of equipment. But the early days was my dad and would be at the factory making yogurt and I'll be trying to push it out, trying to sell it. So a lot of the first few months was years even were just me driving around with a Vaughn to different grocery stores saying, hey, would you buy this yogurt? And like you said at the beginning, it is a highly competitive place, you know, no one. What makes you different to anything? And we started to get a lot of traction with community support, especially like with reviews and that, just people fell in love with us. So Mm -hmm. not only were we trying to sell it, but people were starting to ask for it outside of Pike Place. I think the first actual store that actually talked to me it was Wajimaya. It's an Asian grocery store in a base in Seattle. They have about yeah. five stores. And they said, oh, we have some space. You could use it if you want. And so we pretty much put up a farmer's market set up inside Wajimaya Bellevue between the fish department and the gift department. And we started scooping there. That was one of the first times we were in grocery. And they've been really supportive. It's another family business based in Seattle. And the other things that were going at the same time was those farmers markets. We were doing one on the, the campus of Amazon, okay. which was a Pike Place farmers market outlet just for the summer. We were selling out every day. It was four hours of a market, but we would sell out of yogurt pretty much halfway through the day. And we were making as much as we could at the time. So it's not like you can turn on the tap and say more yogurt's sure. coming sounds like the big yeah. secret here to this was like, yeah. and this is something that I hadn't considered, right? So if I go yeah. to the grocery store to buy yogurt, I have to make a guess. I got to like, I've done this before where I'm like, okay, yeah. this one, this one, and then I'm home with four different kinds and I'm probably only going to like one of them. I mean, that's kind of the bummer, but it sounds like in your case, because you had this gelato style setup, right? You're, you're literally, and it makes it easy for the consumer. You're just like, Hey, just try the one, try one. And then they can just buy it if they want it, but it makes it a lot easier, which is smart and then it sounds like you guys just had a lot of word of mouth like people were just like clamoring to it which is i think we forget about that today in a a social media era nobody thinks about word of mouth and when people ask me like i get an email every single day probably five emails around oh hey here help your help your podcast growth i've grown social media with all this podcast growth stuff and i'm like we're just gonna go word of mouth because that's what we want that's the person that's gonna actually listen you know and then and then that that takes a life of its own later But for now, it's just like we just want word of mouth because we're having good conversations and we want people to connect with that, not some little thing they saw on social media that, you know, no glitter, a kind of kind of strategy. It's something genuine and it's like it created itself. I think that one of my best feelings as well is when even at Pike Place, when people are bringing their family that are visiting in town saying, this is my, my yoga, this is where I go. There's some sort of ownership that people have once because they've discovered it, you know, it's theirs. And we've created this little cult in Seattle that's been so supportive of everything we've done. And it's helped us grow to where we are currently. And I want to talk about the recipe. You don't have to give us the recipe, but in terms of like the difficulty of scaling this thing, right? So you're, you're making it in a very particular part of the world. 
And now you have to try to make it in a different part of the world with different water, different cows, different dairy. And so how did you go navigate that process? So we built the factory in Seattle ourselves. We didn't hire anyone. We just pretty much dug yeah. trenches, put everything together. And then it came to time when we uh, got our first batch of yogurt going. And it was difficult trying to find someone that would sell us milk. You're this new company. Who are you? No one wants to give it to you. But we found a family <clears throat> farm that it's in Linden, Washington, pretty much on the border of Canada. And okay. we, we still use that milk there. They kept on, they were the ones that let us use it. And then we started making yogurt the way we did it. So we use a special blend of cultures that we pretty much brought over from Australia. But what we did here was we were able to change the little things that, you know, family, family tradition said we couldn't do, you know, this is how we've always done it in the past. This is what we do. So we kind of were able to stretch the boundaries of that. And I, I honestly think the yogurt here in Seattle tastes a lot better than any of my cousins or my, uh, my family <laughs> back there. <laughs> but uh, the way we make it is, so different to anything else that anyone would make it just because the effort that is required to make that cup of yogurt is so vastly different to how most yogurts made in the world. I was going to ask you, like a lot of people don't know how yogurt is made. And the reason yeah. I, I kind of, yeah. I don't really know how it's made, but I know at least the equipment used, it looks a lot like a brewery. Like it, the equipment is big tanks. And I just want to give our listeners a sense of like how, and, you know, you don't need to be specific, but at least like yeah. the equipment that it goes through, because in people's head, I don't really think people understand, like, at least for me, it was shocking when I saw these tanks that literally are like brewery tanks. And I'm like, why are there tanks here? And then it all started to make sense to me because you're playing with bacteria yeah. and cultures. And so it's a, there's a process there. But can you just walk everyone through just a quick, you know, don't get too scientific, yeah, but high good. level. Yeah. So the way we make it, so we have a, we have we have tanks and we fill it up with milk and we heat it to a certain temperature and then we put our cultures in it and then it has to incubate. So what that is when the cultures start pretty much multiplying and yeah. it's starting to become yogurt. What we do then is I strain it with some cheesecloth. So this is something that takes a long time. It's about a five day process to get mm -hmm. where we want it to be. Another step that we do that's probably different is we then blend yogurts together. So we make pretty much different flavors using different cultures and then blend it like wine. So the whole time you have to pretty much be tasting it and seeing what, you know, to get that right level of sour, sweet, sure. you're kind of balancing those flavors together. And then after we've got that mixture, then we put it in a cup and then as it's sent out to the stores. That's awesome. Do you ever yeah. think about like, and I don't know if, I don't think this is allowed. I guess I kind of answered my question, but do you ever think about creating a space where it's like a brewery? Like, like literally the, uh -huh. you know, they're making it in the background and then, then instead of tank to tap, it's tank to yogurt cup. You ever think about yeah. that? We've actually, so our first plant, so our original, where we started uh, was in Georgetown. It was tiny and we had this idea of doing something like that, but at the time we were at so much at capacity, there was pretty much no space. It wasn't a safe sure. space probably for it to have anyone in there, but We've always thought that'd be a cool thing to do where people can pretty much see how yogurt's made and even yeah. maybe try and make them it themselves. I think it's something we'd be working on, you know, hopefully post-corona era, yeah. we could probably do something, yeah. I would love to help you with that as a developer. Yeah. That would be a lot of fun. Because, I mean, I just think it'd be like so cool and so unique in a real estate per play that not many people have ever seen before, even thought of or considered. Yeah. Especially, at, I guess, at your company now, right? So at some point, you're always looking for new recipes, which is hard to do with limited equipment. You, it's hard to test yeah. flavors when they take so long to make. But at the stage you're at now, you probably, you know, you probably have four or five, maybe 10 flavors that are, you just know are, are, this is it. Yeah. So flavors, so we pretty much make the one yogurt and then we have a, we sweeten the base with a cane sugar and a honey. That's the flavor of pretty okay. much all the ones that we sweeten. There's a vanilla bean one as well. That's a base that we use that, that took a long time to develop just tasting different vanillas. But yeah. for flavor work, we pretty much tested at Pike Place. So all the flavors that we you see on the shelf from us playing around with things at Pike Place and seeing what's working and not working. We have a lot more flexibility at the store to just see what's seasonal, see what's new, and then put it out there and see what people's feedback is. Yeah, that's the best. I mean, it helps you get the, yeah. you get the instant feedback loop. Is there a flavor that is really difficult to make? So like, let's pretend you and I were, I'm like, yeah. all right, Alex, we're going to go test every yogurt in the world. And then you say, okay, 
but I'm gonna try this one. And it's and it's because this particular flavor is either the most difficult to make or just the most difficult to get right because of the balance of let's say sweet and sour. Is there one that like you would go to, maybe the original, maybe another one? I would say one thing that we've always had problems with uh, some of the basic ones. So it's like, so vanilla bean, we didn't get to like a, maybe a year ago we put it out. So okay. that was one of the most popular flavors of yogurt and everyone's putting out a vanilla, but I think there's extremes of what you get to taste. It's either that alcoholic taste vanilla or that flake vanilla. And with our flavors, it's all about, if we're telling you that this tastes like mango, it's going to be a mango. If this is passion fruit, it's passion fruit. It's not anything that's going to be, it's going to be big, bold flavors that you have okay. no, you could close your eyes and take a spoonful and know exactly what it is. And Got so it. those simpler flavors are the ones where it's harder those subtle ones that don't really come through in yogurt. And then what stores are you guys at now? Like where are you guys at all over the world or I guess the United oh, States? We've been slowly growing. It's just the way we, as I said, the way we make it is just hard to expand a yeah, little it's a bit. capacity just, issue for it's, sure. It's, yeah, yeah, planning it is hard. So it's Whole Foods. We've done Whole Foods down the West Coast in Texas. with Mid-Atlantic now in the Midwest will have it, those regions. We've been working with them. Uh, Amazon Fresh. And then depending on where you are, you can find it on the website. There's a few more stores around the country that you could uh, put your zip code in and figure out if we're nearby, but we're not everywhere yet. When it came to, uh, you're in Dallas now, right? You yeah. said, okay, are you guys building a plant? Do you have a plant in Dallas? So we make it all out of Seattle. What I'm doing okay. here is trying to do some of that stuff that we back in Seattle was building farmers markets, doing events, trying to get people to taste it. Cause as much as I could tell you how good this yogurt is, it's yeah. when you get it in people's mouth, you know, that's what convinces, they can convince themselves. I don't need to say anything. And that's what the best thing of what we do is what we make is that it speaks for itself. And something that happened because of coronavirus, we've stopped, we couldn't demo anymore. And it's mm -hmm. trying to figure out new ways of trying to get people to taste our yogurt. It's been the biggest focus of our last year. Yeah. What have you guys done? So, you know, we talked to a number of companies that during yeah. Corona, same thing, either supply chain issues or they can't go to the grocery store and do these tastings anymore. But did you lean into something in particular during this time? Like, was it market education or just like your, your social media presence? What was the thing that you were like, look, we can't do this. So we have to do this thing. We've been trying a lot of different tactics, but it has been a lot of social media sponsoring posts, influence, those little micro influences, trying to get people to talk about it. We've also had been going to like mom's groups, gyms, trying to just hand out yoga and get people to try it. We did some work with a lot of restaurants in Seattle too, just trying to get chefs to play with it too. Just sure. a lot of recipes you can use our yoga for. It's been, we've been trying a lot of things to see what could replace just, you know, being in front of that yogurt set and giving someone yeah. a spoonful of yogurt. Has there been anything surprising in the market that you've seen from your customers? There's always something that you, maybe you thought, okay, we do good with these people, but it turns out, oh, this group of people loves us. And it's like uh, a surprising thing that you would have never projected in the past. I've always been surprised how many people that our biggest fans are usually the ones that say, I hate yogurt. They okay. are the ones that, yeah. it's usually some dude that's never had, had, had that one yogurt before, you know, that's had a bad taste in his mind, but then... He's tasted ours and it's changed his mind. Now he's buying it for his family. You know, those are yeah. the surprising ones. Yeah. I'm here in LA, which feels like, you know, the vegan capital of the world and everyone's like dairy free. And, you know, there's a whole movement as it relates to how you view your product. Could you ever make this with a nut milk and, and kind of keep that same taste or is it increasingly difficult? We've talked about it with my dad and what options we would have, because especially when we are in California and I'm doing demo, that's a question I get asked all the time, but our focus right now is to try and make this yogurt the best it can be. And I think once we get to a stage where we're happy with where it is, then we could probably experiment with trying something else afterwards. But yeah. they're all our attention is just on this one product at the moment to make sure that it's the best all the time. When it came to making it, is there a specific challenge with just shelf life? Yes, that's completely, that's another big challenge we have, uh, compared to all everyone else on the set, we're pretty much half of what their shelf life is just because there's no preservatives. It's just milk cultures and the fruit. There's nothing else added to it. And the way we make it too, it's just it's exposed to the elements for bits because it's being strained by hand. Sure. So it's just really sensitive. So wow. we've been trying our best to try create clean environments for it. So it doesn't, you know, 
we can try to get that shelf life out a little bit more as much as a day. Even an extra day for us has always been like a big achievement. Yeah. Well, good for you guys for at least yeah. sticking to the, I mean, that's the hard part of any company. And I feel like as people yeah. grow, they always have to compromise, right? Where it's like, they'll start off with a no preservative concept and then they'll realize, oh, it's only going to last seven days, which if your product isn't selling quickly, becomes really difficult to manage because it means you're just throwing away a lot of inventory, but at the same time, you're keeping yeah. your promise. And so it's this, it's, it's a tough business decision to do this. That's one of our biggest challenges right now as well. Just trying to get to the rest of the country. Will you ever think about like sponsoring the Seattle, like any Seattle teams, you know, maybe oh. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be cool. Oh, You're watching the soccer team. They got Elenos on the Jersey. Uh, yeah, mate. Well, one of our, so Yvonne is a huge Seahawks fan and she got me into it. Uh, when one of the, the kicker a few years ago when actually had posted a picture of our cup of pumpkin pie yogurt and wow. we all went nuts. And once they uh, started ordering it for their training facility, that was that was one of the happiest days we got. We got pretty excited for that. So they yeah. are eating it, but we, we're not sponsoring at the moment. I hear that. It's always fun when, uh, you know, we talk yeah. to some companies that are just now getting into that where they're sponsoring either athletes or doing partnerships with, with the major league sports networks. And it's like, it's really cool, you know, and the founders are yeah. always like, I don't know how this happened. Like, this just feels yeah. so crazy. Like they're hanging out with Maria Sharapova and they're like, I don't even, oh. like, I just, I just pinch myself. It's so crazy. But anyway, I can see that happening for you. That seems like a good growth strategy, especially because yeah. you have those roots in, in, in Seattle. Yeah. We've been I'll, a really good Seattle brand. I think that's something that we've been iconic as a Seattle brand. Now it's been, especially going outside of market and people recognize you as from Pike place or from Seattle. It's pretty exciting just to be see that we have fans everywhere now yeah when it, when it comes to funding where are you guys at what stage have you guys uh, done any private equity are you raising money you know what stage would you guys say you're in yeah we have um we've had got funding originally it was a little bootstrapped but we uh mm -hmm. the latest one was with uh the founder of kind yeah daniel lebeski pretty much his team contacted us and told us how much he loved the product he pretty much saw very similar beginnings of kind in Elanos. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, we, we got uh, funding from him to help us expand to the rest of the country. And he's been an excellent partner. It's just his excitement for and passion for Elanos is you know shared for the, with the other founders too. So I'm excited for some you know fun things that are, should be happening in the next few years. Yeah, that's amazing. What a great contact with yeah. someone who knows the space super well too. And so at a, at a minimum can just help save you guys a lot of time probably. Yeah, that's it. And how big is the company now? Like if we, if we were to just tally up everyone inside of manufacturing every, like how big is that company, your company today? So we were about 150 people now. Yeah. So okay. a lot of it is the manufacturing team. There's a big part of it just because that's what they're doing. But yeah. we have now uh, some field marketing and uh, salespeople throughout the country too. That's great. And I imagine, do you guys have like a way to just maybe, maybe you're mailing out these little samplers to buyers during COVID? I don't know. I'm just thinking out oh, loud, like, how do you get your, your grocery buyer to taste it in a COVID yeah, environment? That's, that's it. It's been a lot of posting, you know, and, and it's never the same. I think just getting it from a FedEx box, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't transport well. You, our yogurt is also in a clear cup. We're very particular about how that looks as well. We want to be able, you want to be able to see the puree, the yogurt and if it's been shaken a lot, it ends up looking like a milkshake. So trying to get that whole shelf presence kept That's through awesome. it, you know, yeah, to make sure yeah. it's transported right. And now is, how do you uh, go about pricing? Pricing is always a question, yeah. whereas it's like one thing is what it costs to make. Another thing is what the market is willing to pay for. I think the last time I bought yogurt, it was like a dollar twenty-five a little carton. How do you guys yeah. price it? So we priced it. It's expensive. It's one of the most expensive yogurts you'll see. It's about three, the, a cup is three ninety nine. It's an eight ounce cup, but it's quality. It's milk. It's sure. what, it's what it costs to make. And I think that everyone's used to a commodity where it's, you know, the 10 for tens or the, you know, everything's a dollar. Yeah. That, that's what they used to, but we have shown that people are willing to pay for what that quality is. And we're not racing to the bottom. I think uh, people are going to pay, for, you know, if the money's worth it. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm an investor yeah. in an almond milk company and it's a similar product where it's only four ingredients, but shelf life is the issue. And so one, it's expensive and you have to freeze it. And so it's great for coffee shops. Yeah. So the coffee shop market has just embraced it. 
but for your average consumer who has to thaw this product before using it and then once it's in once they add water and it's in your fridge it only lasts five to seven days which is not a problem if you're drinking it right so i don't yeah. mind that it is more expensive but to your point it's you get what you pay for where there's nothing else in there there's no gums there's no binders there's no fillers it's the cleanest almond milk you could have and it's also super delicious and so it's a tough thing to navigate, but I'm glad to hear you're at least sticking to your guns on pricing. And, but at the same time, the hard part is education, right? Yeah. So how do you guys educate? Cause you, the bottle, the, the, it can only say so much. And so how yeah. do you guys educate your consumer? I think that's where we're trying to get to now. Usually before it was easy, you just let sample people and try to get people to taste. Cause that's what usually educated them that they know that this is very different to what else is on the shelf. Now, I think it's more, it, I think it's going to be more of a social media trying to get reaching more people and trying to get people to tell people our story that way, just in the, what we're looking at in the next few, maybe a year or so. Share that a little bit with us. So, you know, you've told us that you're, you have no preservatives in your product when, as it relates to the other products that people see, what is it that they're doing other than maybe adding preservatives, but like what, what types of things are they doing that maybe uh, someone like me would have no real, no idea. So one of the quickest ways to make yogurt is, is uh, you superheat it. So you heat it up to a temperature that's called ultra high pasteurization. So it's at a high temperature, pretty much kills everything. And then it goes through a pretty much a tube system to cool down and get cultured. And then it gets spit into a cup, it's sealed and it becomes yogurt in the cup. It's like, it, it becomes yogurt, it's liquid and becomes yogurt in a cup. Okay. Whereas ours is compared to that is a slow cook method. We cook at a slow, uh, lower, slower temperature. We yeah. take a longer time to cool down and we have to have it outside. So that's kind of the different, kind of the comparison of the method. So you could make yogurt in half an hour with one method and it takes you a week with the other. That, that's pretty much the biggest difference. It's funny, man. So beer making yeah. is very similar. So yeah. if you like a lot of beer that people buy at the store, they don't realize how processed it is. And so if you're making beer, same, same concept, higher temperatures, you can yeah. add bacteria, you can add CO2 to it on purpose just to get the bacteria moving faster. And it'll take you maybe, let's just say a day to make a keg. Whereas if you're using the best example is like old Belgian methods where it ages on its own. And so it ferments for a week, weeks, right? And so the bacteria yeah. hangs out for three months before you actually, before you're actually serving it. And so again, the difference there is, but there's no preservatives. There's nothing, there's no additives. Yeah. And so you have a natural beer in three months or you have a, a quick beer in like a week. And this is the real difference that brewery struck. So it sounds super similar. One is super delicious and it, I think, if you wait long enough, that's the reaction you'll get of like, oh, I don't like yogurt, but this is great. Oh, I don't, drink, I don't, yeah. I don't drink beer, but this one's different. And it's because it actually is different, right? It's there's, it's yeah. fundamentally different. It's, it's, it's how it's, it's supposed to be. It's how it was meant to be made. You know, it, it was traditionally a method to preserve milk. So that's what we were doing. You know, we're trying to keep it, you know, it's preserving milk in a different way. Yeah. And the awesome. flavor taste, the quality the, you get the flavor of the milk more, you know, you're tasting more of the elements. And then we take that same method with all the purees and fruits we make. We try to, we're not using any colors or flavors. So that plays to the problem with our, our fruit as well, because a lot of fruit oxidizes. So like strawberries, for example, go brown. So it's yep. part of, you know, uh, rhubarb is one that does goes brown a lot too. So all these flavors we use, we're trying to make sure that we have color, you know, color is a big part of what it looks like without compromising what we want to do, you know, with uh, no preservatives, no colors on their additives. It's just how food's meant to be. And even that changes too, because yeah. you can have in one season, you know, a certain apple might put off more color than a different season. I've seen that in the beer making world too. Oh, yeah. Well, I like that. At least the commitment. Yeah. You got to go yeah. big on that. You got to lean into the education of that big time. I mean, that's the whole company. Yeah. That's I, one thing that you just reminded me of is even subtle changes in the milk, depending on the season. So the cows might, you know, winter see what the cows are eating difference in the seasons changes kind of the flavor of the milk. And every so often uh, we have this, I don't know, everything seems to align, like the milk tastes right, it incubated well, you know, mm -hmm. and we've got the right blend. And then we get this like gold star blend of yogurt that came out. So whenever I taste that batch, I always send a message out to the production team that this is a, you know, this is a vintage batch that just came out and it's, <laughs> it's almost like champagne. We want to be able to you know, celebrate that this, this, if you're going to eat yogurt this week, make sure you go right now. You know, this is a good batch. 
Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's amazing, man. But it makes it hard to scale, but that's okay. Because yeah. at least you got the that's pricing it. and it sounds like you got the right team. Yeah, we've, we've got a really good team now, uh, especially with uh, with Daniel Lebetsky. We were able to get a, a pretty strong uh, executive team now. So instead of us, uh, Vaughn, Bob, me and my dad uh, wearing all the hats, we've got a pretty solid team that's able to help us grow and scale. Yeah, what has that been like for you? So all of a sudden you went from like doing everything, now you have executives in the room who are proven leaders, but they're not always right. That's kind of the hard part, right? They come with a lot of experience, but to me like data changes, right? Data at one point isn't data today. Uh, has that been difficult? Has that been kind of easier than you might've thought? Data was something I don't think we we had 100% okay. hold on what people were looking at. I didn't realize everyone was all about the, we realized quickly that in our industry it was all about velocities. So mm -hmm. how many units per store per SKU per week was what everyone was looking for. And we were killing it in Seattle. So that's why we got so much attention, I think. But to us, we were just seeing what the sales, ours was always been make more yoga, make the best yoga sales. And our team kind of has helped us figure out what the landscape is. I think what okay. everything else is about understanding different aspects of it that we weren't doing it ourselves, you know, and it's in, going to be integral to the success and the future growth of Eleanor's because making so that we're building out a strong not only executive team but our whole fan like Eleanor's family from the from the person that's cooking the milk to the person that's scooping a pike place we want to make sure that they understand that our company got started by it with a lot of passion you know and Avon with Avon and a lot of family values and I think we want to make sure that our team understands that completely yeah. as we grow and scale and I think if we keep on doing that Eleanor's will be able to take over the U.S. I think so. I'm excited to try yeah. it. When, when it comes yeah. to, I guess, how you guys view the future, is there a D to C play or, or is it just tried and true of being in the store? We've tried to um, do some D to C. It's just hard shipping a, you know, a refrigerated right. product to, directly to customers. I think we'll be working. We'll definitely be trying to work on something just to get to customers with maybe some shipping, but I think it's trying to figure out what, what works without paying an exorbitant amount of shipping fees to get it. You know, six cups of yogurt to you. That's the hard part with the almond yeah. milk too. They were they were shipping yeah. it with like dry ice, and it just doesn't. I mean, it's it's great. Don't get me wrong, but it's expensive, right? You're all of a sudden now paying twelve dollars extra for shipping or twenty dollars extra for shipping, and it's also not sustainable. And so there's a lot of people that don't like it, frankly. Yeah. It's big and bulky, but maybe maybe the strategy is you guys do a bunch of gelato stands or gelato type, right? Just like you do in Pike's Place, and instead of shipping, that becomes your your conduit. I think that's what our next try was uh, to be these like the farmers markets. We have like little uh, gelato carts. They have like a little bicycle attachment on it. And we're mm -hmm. going to be doing those in a kind of pop-ups in different parts of the country. So I'm doing one in Dallas. Uh, we're going to do one in LA shortly. And then probably as we enter new markets, we'll probably start to see some of them pop up around the place. And yeah. that's probably somewhere where people can come down. They can talk to us because yeah, we're the ones that make it. You can t ask us any questions about yogurt and we'll be able to explain exactly what it's all about. You know, it's funny too, because coming out of COVID, there's a lot of flexibility now in real estate where it's like th these these landlords are forced to do something creative or just create areas or rent out the building for a week or a weekend where they just yeah. pop up friendly, which I think allows a lot of companies to just experiment and say, hey, look, let's try it. Let's do a pop up. And if it goes well, maybe we consider a retail strategy or maybe not, but it's a, it, you know, the litmus test is super fast. The feedback cycle there is quick. Yeah, I think, and then the issue that we're having at the moment with these things is what's it like in a post, uh, you know, pandemic era as well, the people, are people out and about? And I think so far from what I've seen, especially in Dallas, it's that people are wanting to go out and try new things and be outside. It's a nice time of year. So yeah. I think I'm a little more confident now that we will be able to do something like that. You know, I certainly next think few so. Months, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think everyone's tired of it. At least here in LA, yeah. I can I look around and it's just like, whoa, everyone's out. And obviously the weather's like perfect now. And so people are just over staying at home and want to interact. And all the single people are just dying to meet other people. And so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Zoom dating is, is over, yeah. which is funny. I think it's been a difficult year with these yeah, it's, it's even working remotely talk it's not the same as being in you know in the factory or you know being able to talk to people one-on-one -on -one. i didn't think that you know it doesn't translate the same way yeah and no. kind of puts everything on pause but i think we're, we're in for a good year i totally agree
Well, well, listen, man, tell everyone where they can find you, where they can support the company, all that good stuff. So if you want to find somewhere close to you, uh, check our website out, elanos.com, or uh, you're pretty much your local Whole Foods. If you're in one of our regions down in LA, it's uh, Bristol Farms, or uh, you can find us at Nuggets as well, and uh, NorCal, Seattle, it's a Met Market. My PCC. wife loves Bristol yeah. Farms. She yeah. loves Bristol Farms. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go and get yeah. this tomorrow. That's good stuff. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, Alex, thanks for coming on the podcast, brother. I wish you nothing but success. I'm excited. I love that you guys are committing and staying true to your product and really leaning into just making sure people get the best experience. I feel like a lot of companies take shortcuts on that path, and it sounds like you're not doing that, which is which is great. I mean, it's honest, and it's the best experience for the consumer. All right, thank you very much. It was great to talk to you, too.